Uh, Troy runs a, a team of uh, solution architects at Ivan who focus on a whole collection of open source tools uh, running in public clouds. Um, today, our speaker will cover uh, the difference between regular databases and columnar databases and how to get the best performance out of ClickHouse columnar databases. Please welcome our speaker. Thank you very much. Um, just uh, like every good cooking show, folks, I like to start with something that here's something we prepared earlier. Uh, when we get to the demo, this is what you'll be seeing. Uh, there's just a little ClickHouse service that I've created here. Uh, if anyone really cares, it's running in Google uh, in Southeast One, but that sort of doesn't make too much of us. And you'll see that I've also created this data file uh, that does some things like create some tables and load some test data for us. Uh, more from our demo service later in the presentation. Uh, so welcome everyone. Thank you very much. I want to start by saying thank you for joining us here today. My name's Troy Sellers. I'm a staff solution architect uh, for a company called Ivan. Um, we do many things at Ivan. One of the things that I think I'm most proud of is the company's contribution to the open source community. We were founded in 2016. Uh, by four pretty passionate uh, software engineers that were committing to the Postgres project at the time. And one of the things they wanted to do was give back to the open source community. And so they had this idea they could create a company that runs purely open source data technology. Uh, and today we've got 10, I think, uh, I think it's around 10 engineers that work for our open source project office whose entire job is to commit back upstream into projects like Kafka, projects like Postgres, and projects like OpenSearch. Uh, so I'm really proud to be able to come down and talk to everyone about open source technology and what we do. Um, a staff solution architect at Ivan, we are the technical support uh, for our customer base in a, lot of, in a lot of scenarios. When you run 12 different open source, uh, open source data projects, what that means is I am a jack of all trades and a master of none. So <laughs> I want to get started today. Who here is an expert in ClickHouse? Perfect. <laughs> My just-in-time learning will suffice. Excellent. So I, that doesn't surprise me, right? Like I um, heard, at first heard about ClickHouse about mid last year when it came internally into our company that we were going to start running this service uh, for our customers. And so I jumped in. And this is a good example of what this uh, presentation might be: is the things I had to learn about to understand what ClickHouse was, uh, in order to talk to people like yourselves about it. So thank you for joining me. Today's journey is going to be pretty simple. We're going to sort of start off um, and we're going to cover, like, what is just the main difference? Like, we want to talk about what the problem is that ClickHouse is trying to solve. And I think it's an important spot to start there um, because that'll lead us to what ClickHouse is and what are the business cases that we should be thinking about using it and how, you know, why does it work the way it does and all those kind of things. We'll show you a little demo uh, because what's a technology presentation without a demo? Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that you should not do with ClickHouse. Okay, this is not the kind of thing that you like throw all our databases out. We have a new database now. I'd encourage you not to think about it like that. <clears throat> Uh, and finally, uh, there'll be some QR codes and stuff like that, so you can scan for further resources, um, which is mainly just links to documentation. Uh, sound good? So thank you everyone in the room, thank you everyone online for joining us. I know we're going out live today as well, so that's pretty exciting for me. It's my first live stream presentation ever, I think. So let's talk a little bit about data and the purpose of data and what that means to people. Let's imagine a couple of things that we're all pretty familiar with, okay? Uh, online shopping, right? Um, some IoT devices, there's that concept of this, you know, this stream of events, any kind of application that you have on your phone, right? The, the amount of data that's coming out of today's modern world uh, to, to roll out an, an often overused trope uh, is growing exponentially and there's no sign of stopping that. And this is the kind of thing that really helps us as technologists, ClickHouse is the kind of database that helps us as technologists make sense of all that data. Okay, as, as the size of data increases and the volume and frequency of data increases, historically we had to make decisions about which data we thought was going to be useful to support the business cases we were trying to support. And quite often we had to make decisions about which data should we throw away, which data should we not collect at all, okay? 
And then we had to sort of look forward into the future and try and imagine what questions people were going to ask us. So we could keep that data um, there as it, keep, keep that data that's ready for queried. Um, this was kind of a function of storage being a little bit expensive. It was kind of a function of like how hard it is to process data sets uh, in certain scenarios with some of the sort of more traditional technologies. Uh, but today, you'll see this is pretty relevant when we talk about um, analytics and the analytic power of ClickHouse. This is a really good example of where this starts to come in. Has anyone heard of Apache Kafka? Everyone, everyone that's definitely the type of question that everyone's supposed to raise their hand to, it's just to see if everyone's awake. Um, but that concept of like, you now have an unbounded, continuous stream of data. Okay, so how do you start to choose which event in this stream is going to be relevant? Okay, and these kind of real-time streaming event-driven architectures, as they're called, really highlight that problem. How do you make the decisions about which data you want to keep? And it's an interesting thing to think about. We've all sort of heard these terms. Does it go into a data warehouse, a data lake? Do you put it in a database? Um, these things mean different things to different people. Um, my favourite follow-up question when anyone tells me they have a data warehouse is, what do you think that means? And I've heard answers from actual data, what I think an actual data warehouse is, to I've run it in Postgres, to we have S3. Like it's, there's all sorts of things. It's a really big umbrella term. And so we want to talk a little bit about where does ClickHouse fit into this. Uh, at Ivan, we are, fair to say, pretty popular with Postgres. We, we, we do love Postgres. We run a lot of it. Uh, like I said, our first service we ever ran uh, was Postgres. But it's fair to say that Postgres is not the solution here. Okay? You're going to run into problems just with size and storage on disk and stuff. And that is because of a fundamental nature in the way that these things work. Um, if you're not familiar with this, like you've probably all, all heard about this, this difference between transaction processing and analytic processing. So let's imagine that online store scenario, okay? You've got a shopping cart, you've got someone that comes in, let's say that uh, Catherine here, she wants to come in and go shopping and there's an awful lot of data that Catherine might interact with. But there's some interesting things, right? She might update her delivery preferences, she might update her phone number, her email address. There is a row in a transactional database that she is going to be interacting with. Okay, and the, the way that that database works is built to make sure that you can find that row, update that row very efficiently, very quickly. Okay, indexing and all this kind of stuff, and we'll talk a little bit about it. But it really solves that problem. Catherine wants to come on in and update a record that's particular to her. She wants that to be in a transaction. Okay, it needs to be um, consistent. Then there's this different type of interaction that happens on this on online store. While Catherine is navigating that, she's looking at products, she's clicking on links, okay, she's coming in and out, having different sessions. There's all sorts of things. She's adding things to carts, she's removing things from carts, she might, might be clicking the buy button. There's all these different events on this kind of online store that are different to that concept of like her single record. And these events we typically want to start to do some kind of analytical processing on. What is the most popular product people are looking at? What is the most popular you know, product that's been added to cart in the last 12 hours? Right? These kind of things typically are different queries from a transactional database. Typically, they aggregate large volumes of data. Okay, typically the data is immutable. This event stream data is pretty interesting about that. Typically, they don't retrieve an entire row of data. Okay, they're gonna aggregate across just a few columns of that data set. This is like sort of the main takeaway. If all you take away from what's the difference here between ClickHouse and a transactional database, it's this slide. Okay, if you're online, you can flip to YouTube now. Uh, that's, that's it, okay? This is the thing, is that when you're in an analytic processing database, you usually only want to retrieve some of the data to do some aggregations across it. And that leads us quite nicely into how ClickHouse does this and what ClickHouse is for. So a, a brief history, again, for those, like no one is really familiar with it. ClickHouse, 
that use case we just described, that capturing web analytics, was exactly what this database was described and built for. It was built by a company called Yandex in 2016 and open sourced uh, out of the generosity of their heart for, for all of us to enjoy and love. Yandex are the second largest web analytics platform in the world, according to Wikipedia, um, based out of Russia. But that concept of like ingesting hundreds of millions and billions of rows of data really, really quickly and then running aggregation queries on it is exactly what this technology was built for. Since then, I thought it's really good to talk about like just the open source community behind this project. Like the community's really taken this project um, and, and run with it. There's a lot um, of total contributors. There's a really a, re a real strong collection of active contributors to this project. Um, and it's really becoming popular out there in the world. It's one of those things that we don't take on lightly as well. Like as we, there's a fairly strong consist, uh, criteria about us adopting a project to operate for our customers. Um, and that's definitely one of them. So we talked about this idea of what row-orientated data looks like in Postgres. Now when you sort of scratch underneath the surface, what that means is that the rows themselves are typically stored in contiguous files on disks. Okay, and so it means that if you want a row, you can go and find that row and you're not scanning across different parts on disk. You're actually getting to it really quickly and you can go, right, this row is this big, I can just scan this many bytes and I have that row of data. Okay, this works really good, but if you can see, if you want just to aggregate one column, there's an awful lot of data you have to read off disk, hold in memory, and throw away. Okay, it's wasteful in that kind of sense. And so you're kind of reading the whole database to do an aggregation query. Where if you think about a columnar orientated database, rather than storing rows, you store columns as files. And if you get into the uh, inner workings of a ClickHouse database, when you open up and see the file system, this is exactly what you'll see. You'll see an index, uh, you'll see a few other indexes in there in each, for each table, and then you'll see a file per column. Okay, and that makes it really simple to say, aggregate all the data in one column, because now I only have to go and read a single file. Okay, I don't have to pull that record out of individual files or places on disk. And this is why this sort of really helps. One of the sort of first kind of things that makes ClickHouse incredibly performant for this is just the very simple fact that the way data is stored on disk is different. And this columnar database is not brand new to ClickHouse. There's heaps of other services that do this columnar stuff. Um, what's in interesting about that <coughs> Also, is that it, this is one of the things that ClickHouse does really well, is that now that you have columns of data, you also have columns of the exact same data type. And it's not immediately obvious, but what ClickHouse allows you to do here is now you can specify individual compression algorithms that are suited for the particular data type that you're storing on disk. So not only is ClickHouse incredibly fast, at retrieving data, it's incredibly efficient at storing it on disk. Like, it's incredibly efficient. Well, there's a benchmark post somewhere on our blog that just talks about the size we benchmarked ClickHouse against a Postgres service on a, a data set of about four and a half billion rows of data. And the size on disk was about half. Like, and it's just because of this um, efficiency that you get. If you've got all integers, or if you've got all timestamps, or if you've got all floats, you can start to specify individual compression algorithms on those uh, as you write that to disk. It's kind of useful. Here's an example of how you'd create that and sort of if you wanted to get down and dirty with it yourself. Uh, you, when you create those tables, you can specify individually how that data is going to be stored on disk. The second thing to talk about is in this columnar orientated fashion, and by the way, this is a broad brush on just some of the things that ClickHouse does to make things incredibly efficient. Uh, it is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, so if you're interested in some of this stuff, then I definitely recommend hit the documentation for ClickHouse. But ClickHouse has a primary index. Who knows what a primary index is? Yep, again, another one just to check everyone's awake. Um, <clears throat> so there is a primary index in ClickHouse. One of the first surprising things about a primary index that I found is that it's not unique. 
There is no requirement for uniqueness in your primary index. Uh, the second thing is it's what's called a sparse index. And so what that means is for every 8,192 rows of data, you have an entry in your primary index. The thing again that's not immediately obvious, this means that this has got some kind of sort order in it. Okay, now this sounds really odd about, but then you think about what analytic queries do. Okay, so analytic queries probably don't go and fetch a single line of data from the database. Okay, analytic queries probably aggregate over millions or hundreds of millions or billions of rows of data. And if you think, let's, let's call that 10,000 because the maths is easier. There's now 1,000 or 100 rows in the index for every million records. Okay, and so that when I want to go and su scan a subset of data, I can go and pick out blocks, uh, what they call granules, uh, of data and, and sort of read that in, into memory and process it really quickly. One of the things you'll find when you start to work with ClickHouse, it's very, very good at figuring out exactly what data to read into memory. Okay, and, and it's very good at leaving memory on disk if it doesn't need it. This sparse index is one of those things. Now you can specify um, different primary keys and sort orders on tables. Um, typically they're the same value. 8,192 apparently makes more sense for those that think in binary. I'm one of the 10 people, uh, I think, in normal numbers. Um, and it just sort of makes that a bit easier to, to look at. The, the second thing that you can define, or one of the other things, I should say, that you can define in ClickHouse is a skip index. Um, now, it's kind of analogous if you're, if you're familiar with sort of more relational data structures of defining secondary indexes on your database. So if you're familiar with like a primary index and then you can define a secondary index to say help search performance or something like that in a Postgres service, it's kind of analogous to that. Um, but remember we don't store data in rows. So having a secondary index on that row of data sort of doesn't really make sense. And so what you can define is a, is a thing called a skip index. And skip index, oh, pardon me, skip indexes um, allows you to sort of tell the, the ClickHouse query engine is that, look, you can go to this index and skip over a certain amount of data. Uh, inside that. It defines what you can skip when you're processing it. And a good example of something like this might be, um, sorry. You think about like um, you've got uh, time series data, right? Uh, that, let's go back to that online web store. It's a great example. You are going to have time series data, excellent use case for your primary key. It's going to be ordered, it's going to be blocked, it's going to be searchable, right? All that kind of stuff. Uh, but then you might say, well, you know what? We've got a pretty well-known requirement that we want to aggregate every 403 error. Okay, we want to know when people are trying to log in and it's failing. And we want, to, we want to be able to aggregate that. So that kind of HTTP error might be make a really good skip index. You want to say, we're going to query this table a lot for all the 403 errors. And it will keep a secondary index on disk about where in each block the 403 errors live. And so you can go and query the primary index and it'll query the secondary index and it'll only pull that data together for that query. There's a lot more to talk about with skip indexes. Um, this is sort of one of the the interesting pieces of ClickHouse that when you get right into the details, you'll start to talk more about it. There's a number of sort of other mechanisms around indexing um, that's worthwhile to understand about ClickHouse. But like where I, I find this really interesting is that all these things are kind of focused on how to take a query and not retrieve data from disk. <laughs> uh, and it's very efficient at that. And so to answer, finally answer the sort of the fourth part of this, what I thought was important to talk about in the time we had today, when we talk about the, the speed is like we've covered, it's a columnar database and, and the, the advantages of that for querying. We've talked about, you know, the data compression by type, which is kind of used. We've talked about this physical sparse index, the primary keys. And then the last thing is this vectorized query ex execution, which is a very long-winded say, work, uh, long-winded way of saying that it uses multiple processes. Okay, so because it was written in the world of um, multi-processor computers, 
they've understood that they can take a column of data and separate it and run it on the processes that are available and aggregate the result uh, in the end there. And there's a lot of stuff that happens underneath the covers. This is one of those nice things about ClickHouse that you never have to worry about. It just does it. And so it really takes a lot, um, uh, really takes advantage of the hardware that's available uh, to the service. So it's really nice. And again, I, I sort of mentioned the, be the benchmark that we did. It's worthwhile if you're really interested to jump out and have a look at it. Um, while you're looking at benchmarks, uh, I would encourage you to all to take that with the largest grain of salt that you can find. Um, benchmarks make an awful lot of assumptions um, about data. And so the data set that we've benchmarked our stuff on might not be the data set that you want to run on. Um, but it's, it's an interesting sort of heuristic to think about. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, let's, have, let's see ClickHouse in action. Um, and and we'll, we'll see how we can run some queries and stuff here. Oh, yes, yeah, so I was going to tell you what, what we were going to show. Let's do that. Uh, there's a data set that is all the menus uh, for restaurants in New York from like 1850 uh, onwards. It's on the ClickHouse documentation. There's a whole bunch of test data sets. Uh, this data set, I think it's about 1.3 million rows, so it's not massively huge, uh, but it's kind of fun to play with. Uh, it'll work today. Um, I am going to use my ClickHouse client today. Excellent. Okay. So let's start with just sort of have a look at what we've done here. So the first thing to note is that the ClickHouse data set comes with four tables. And we've created this denormalized table here as well. Okay. Remember what we spoke about the difference between analytical processing and transaction processing, how one's row-based and one's column-based. The fact that if you've got column-based data sets and column-based processing means that really wide data tables with plenty, like hundreds and hundreds and thousands of columns, work really well in ClickHouse. It works really, really well. It allows you to index it, it allows you to query it back. Remember, we're only ever going to pull columns. Uh, so you get no penalty at all for having denormalized data. So it's a really good thing to do. So what's happened here as part of the script is we've taken that and, and we've denormalized that data set. Um, so let's have a look at some queries. And because no one wants to watch me fat finger a keyboard, um, I'm going to copy and paste that. So let's take a quick query and run that here. So what have we got? We've taken per, per decade account an average price of the menu. And you'll see um, that things were pretty stable for a while and then things got expensive. Uh, if anyone's been to Manhattan lately, you probably understand this to be true. But what is really interesting about ClickHouse, it's probably hard to see from up the back especially. Um, this is what I kind of like down the bottom. That took Point, uh, so two tenths of a second to process 1.3 million rows of data and it actually scanned in 54 meg of data which is by no means the entire data set. Okay? And when you start to play with ClickHouse this kind of response works really well. Think about the use case where this is really well deployed into your business. Okay? What's really fantastic about ClickHouse is real-time analytics especially if you want to expose this out to, say, your customers or to people on a mobile phone, or you want to have that analytics engine out in your customer's world where they can sort of query it themselves um, or, you know, use a UI to pull data back that's relevant to them and they get a really performant experience. Um, let's have uh, a little look at uh, dishes. What could you buy that had potatoes in it in 1850? Uh, in 1850 in New York, you could have mashed, baked, plain or boiled. So culinary extravaganza in 1850s uh, with potatoes. Uh, let's have a look. Let's see what's happened in 2010. Uh, did chefs get any more imaginative? Um, yes, look at that. They got more imaginative and uh, a little bit wordier. <laughs> And it's probably about here they realise that menus are printed on A4 pieces of paper. So, but is that, yeah, is that just something that's relevant to potatoes or did we spot? Maybe is there a trend there? So let's go and have a look. Um, can we pull out, like, what's the length, the average length of 
menu titles across the years. And as we suppress, yes, in the 2000s, people realised that perhaps we're getting out of hand. Uh, and we've started to drop back. So some fun things uh, to play around with ClickHouse. Again, we're looking at that two hundredths of a second row. These are, and these are great. Like if you look at some of the queries of what you're doing here, you're doing count, roundings, um, extracting things, you're running functions. Like they are, they're queries that are scanning the entire data set. Um, and this is sort of a really good example of A, queries that work better in an analytical processing scenario, uh, and B, things that... <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, you know, the, uh, how, how ClickHouse works and, and how it can make some fun stuff there as well. My favourite, let's see if we can figure out what the average price of a beer in uh, was. And it looks like things got really expensive there again. I, at 1980s for a buck for a beer. Um, I don't know. I don't trust the data on that one for some reason. I'm not sure what happened to $28 for beers. But anyway... Uh, again, just some fun things to have. The, I definitely encourage you to go and have a look at the ClickHouse data set. There's a lot of different ones in there. There's uh, all the rides on taxis and, and stuff like that. And, and you can really sort of get a feel for how to set this up and, and load data. Ingesting data actually is one of those things that's really, really useful. Um, the ClickHouse is very good at. The, the, the interesting thing about having a data set um, like in columnar format, and ClickHouse does this very well, is that it's really easy to write data to disk. And so if you're going to load data in and you're going to set this up in production, like inserting a single row at a time is a bad idea. When you insert data into ClickHouse, it takes it and writes it to disk and then comes back in time and merges it in and fills it out and does the things behind the scenes. But its first job is to get the data and write it to disk. Okay, so if you're going to write one row at a time, you're going to get a lot of these really, really small part files inside your ClickHouse data. They recommend like a million records at a time to ingest data. And so it's a really, really neat kind of scenario. <coughs> One of the things that we didn't see, pardon me, I'll go through this again. Uh, this concept, these are the da data tables that we're just looking at. There's an interesting thing that you've, that might be new, it was new to me, this concept of a table engine. And so when you define a table in ClickHouse, you can actually define per table how data is stored on disk. Like how are you going to treat that data? And there's a number of different table engines. Uh, the merge tree family of table engines is by far and away the most common and popular one. It's the one that's, uh, for the scenarios we've discussed, is... Uh, is exactly what that's built for, for ingest and, and analytic queries. And there's, there's a few others. We'll talk about a couple others in a second. The, the, this replication merge tree is just a merge tree, but also that is replicated across multiple nodes. Um, ClickHouse supports replication across multiple nodes for high availability and all that kind of stuff. I did speak a bunch about primary keys, remember? And you'll notice there's no declaration of a primary key there but there's an order ID, okay? So whenever you specify that sort order, order by this ID, you're telling it that I want it to be a primary key as well. So we're gonna do the index on that sort order. Um, just for those that are playing at home. <coughs> um, some other things that you, ClickHouse does is allow some really interesting type of data formats to pull data into the database as well. Uh, there's a lot of different functions. There's a lot of ways to pull data from other data sources into ClickHouse. Uh, Parquet, Avro, um, CSV, TSV, Protobuf, all these kind of things are available for you to pull in. There's an awful lot of formats to pull into the database and cl the ClickHouse engineers have made that uh, very easy to do. You can pull data from S3, you can pull data from all different sources. Uh, we spoke about that. Uh, this is a good example. This is what we did run. Okay, so this is how we just pulled and denormalized that data once we got it in there. We just selected, <coughs> um, create the table, and you can sort of create as a select. It's kind of a neat little way of, of building data inside ClickHouse as well. There's an awful lot of different ways to do this, functions or table engines and stuff. We won't sort of talk about that. 
But what about that scenario we touched on is like, well, you've got this stream of data in Apache Kafka. It's unbounded. It's never going to stop. How do you get that across into this world of I want to be able to run a table um, and, and do some real-time stuff? Well, there's this thing in ClickHouse called the Kafka table engine, which connects to a topic inside Apache Kafka and represents itself as a consumer group on that topic. Um, What's that, what means, what's interesting about that is that you sort of have to build inside your world a materialized view. Welcome to another table engine uh, inside ClickHouse. Because, and for those of us that have played with Kafka a little bit, you sort of get to read data from a topic once and then you advance the offset. And so the idea behind the way ClickHouse works is the, the Kafka engine reads data once, the materialized view takes that data and puts it in a table that you're going to query multiple times, uh, and then your Kafka engine is ready to read data at the latest offset in Kafka, because Kafka you don't want to be reading off disk. Uh, it's an interesting sort of pattern. Uh, here at Ivan, it's one of those things we like to make easier, those integrations, so you can kick, uh, click a couple of buttons and get that done. This is just an example of running those kind of things. I mean, this is just a recording of it working. <laughs> Um, so, if it's just a recording, is it really working? Uh, no, that's, that's just kind of how this works. This is this good example of running real-time analytics off a real-time data stream uh, that you want to do things like expose back to customers or to different internal business stakeholders. These kind of things really work really well. Um, and and it's, a nice, it's a nice pattern to get used to. The other sort of Postgres, or the other uh, table engine we support at Ivan is this concept of reading data from Postgres. So I'll go back to our online store analogy again. Um, Catherine was looking at product ID 138, right? But maybe in this table you want to know what the name of that product is, what its price, perhaps, right? And so you can query Postgres inside ClickHouse. And you can pull up and query that data either as a reference table and what the Postgres engine will keep that data table in Postgres available to the service periodically inside ClickHouse. And you can then start to use that uh, to build your queries in ClickHouse uh, and get some more end user meaningful type of reference data uh, if that's kind of one of your things you can do there. There's an interesting pattern we're working on at the moment in the, in the SA group is to use this uh, concept with the ability to select from into as a way to archive data out of Postgres. It's kind of a fun kind of world. We've got a bunch of customers that use Postgres uh, for time series database because, like I said, we love Postgres. And so they're like, hey, I've got terabytes of this time series data in Postgres. How do I get it to ClickHouse? Like, All right, well, maybe we can run that select into and then you can clean out that Postgres table. Uh, interesting world we live in now. Okay, <clears throat> um, I hope that some of these things that we spoke about um, sort of fired that use case of uh, maybe I shouldn't use this for transactions. It's not a transactional database, right? It's not a transactional database. You can do deletes because we all have to be GDPR compliant, okay? But you don't want to be sort of updating and deleting individual records in ClickHouse. You're not, it's not going to like it. It is not a key value store, okay? If you want to run Redis, run Redis. <laughs> um, it is not a file store. If you want S3, run S3 or S3 things, right? It's not a file store and it is not a document store. Okay, while I say that, it does support JSON. There's like JSON engines and stuff in there to support JSON, so if you want to drop documents in there. Um, but again, the use cases that you typically use something like a MongoDB for, back to that point is they tend to be, they can be update heavy as well, right? You don't want to be updating database records very often inside ClickHouse. So I'm going to stop. Um, I think I'm close to running out of time. I wanted to make sure we left some time for any questions, uh, for either in the room or if we've got the capability to take them online. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but we'll have a microphone if anyone wants some questions. While someone thinks about the most hardest question that you can stump me with, that's not that hard, by the way, uh, what we've got here is our over on your left, my right, 
um, is just a link to a whole bunch of resources that Elena put together that I found really helpful to get started for this. Uh, on the left, my left, your right, is a link to a GitHub repository that is that Terraform script that I built and loaded all that data, uh, if you want. Uh, and if you want to run that one, there is a free trial for Ivan, uh, so you can go and sort of run ClickHouse uh, and do that as well. I will thoroughly recommend, um, if you're interested, getting onto ClickHouse uh, and starting with the documentation there. It's very, very well documented. It's very well explained. Um, but yeah, I will take questions. We've got one up the back. I'll just wait for you to get the mic if, if we can, just so those online can um, can hold you accountable in future years. Uh, you mentioned like uh, pulling in data. So if you have like say a large number of clients, whether they be say mobile app clients or IoT devices, you said it's not good to write one at a time, like uh, data mm. one at a time. What would be the recommended way to stream data in? Is it via directly into ClickHouse, or should you be putting that something in front of it and then whatever that services then streams the data into ClickHouse? Yeah, it's a good question. Typically, I'd probably have something like Kafka in front of that. Um, Kafka is definitely um, going to handle sort of the ingest on that. Does some nice things like orders things in time as well, gives you the ability to process it in other scenarios. Um, there's also a, a fun conversation to have around IoT devices, around network security and, and network boundaries, because now you've got to expose endpoints somewhere to the internet, potentially. Um, and so, again, like having either, you know, an API and Kafka in front of that, I would prefer to do that rather than expose my ClickHouse service. And then the last, which you absolutely hit on, you're still just going to try and insert one record at a time, just at massive volume. I would imagine you would break ClickHouse pretty quickly. What the Kafka engine does, which is not immediately obvious, is it actually reads in batches. It'll take that and, and take those batches off that topic and insert them for you. So it handles that for you as well. Good question. Thank you very much. Hi. I just wanted to ask, is there any integration with Redis? Uh, is there any integration with Redis? That's an excellent question. Is not at the moment on the Ivan service. I don't know if there's a Redis function. I didn't see one, but the amount of things that I don't know could fill this room. Um, so I don't know, to be honest. I don't, I don't think so, but I'd love to be proven wrong. Is there a... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, was, I was about to have a conversation, but the answer's I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Anything else? It was either a wonderfully concise and easy to digest talk or not. Um, <laughs> all right. Hey, folks, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, I hope you have a wonderful conference. It's the first of three days. Um, so I'd like to thank the organisers for having us here. Um, it's, and I'd like to thank everyone for uh, turning up as well. It's, it's always a, a wonderful um, show of support for open source communities that you folks take time out of your busy day. Uh, and I hope you have a wonderful day and, and learn some interesting things. Thank you very much.